Thank you, Dr. Benson. And again, my apologies to the audience. You're probably really tired of my voice. I promise I'm going to stop talking. Um, but I do have the distinct pleasure of getting to introduce our next speaker, Dr. David Spack from University of Washington. Dr. Spock is a professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Allergy and Infectious Disease at University of Washington, and also the PI and Clinical Director of the Mountain West AIDS Education and Training Center. He is a distinguished clinician teacher based at the Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. He is a primary clinical focus in infectious diseases and HIV care, um, and uh, he is going to be speaking to us um, today on vaccine prevention for individuals with HIV in the era of COVID. Dr. Spock, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Great, Rafi, thank you very much. And I just want to begin by thanking everybody for inviting me to participate in this conference, and I do not have any financial disclosures. Now, for what I'm going to try and tackle in this is to really uh, go over some bread and butter issues related to immunizations, but try and put a spin on this related to what we're doing now in the current COVID era, what we've been doing. So the main thing I'm going to focus on are going to be, first of all, the timing of administering vaccines um, with COVID vaccines and new recommendations on this, summarize pneumococcal vaccine schedules in people with HIV, discuss our approach to initial hepatitis B immunizations, and then address the issue of what do you do when somebody doesn't respond to hepatitis B vaccine, and then last specifically go over a few things related to what we know about actually giving COVID vaccines to persons with HIV. And interestingly enough, today in the New England Journal, there's two new articles. So this is like a popcorn popper that's going off with new information. So I'll hopefully be able to touch on some of that new information as well. Uh, in terms of special vaccine considerations in the era of COVID, these are two issues that I'm going to address that um, are related to this that are really coming up in the clinic over and over again. So here's a case that addresses this. This is an audience response question, a polling question. So a 36-year-old woman with HIV received her first dose of hepatitis A vaccine and with a follow-up recommended at 6 to 12 months after the first dose. Uh, so due to COVID, she doesn't come back for her second dose scheduled vaccine, which has commonly occurred, but now it's in the clinic. And it's two years out from her first dose. So here's a polling question. So the question is, what should be recommended regarding her hepatitis A vaccine? So would it be, number one, start over and give two doses per the recommended schedule? Number two, pick up where you left off and then go ahead and give one dose now. Or three, no further doses are needed. So if everybody can chime in on that, that'd be great. All right, since there are only three choices, let's go ahead and see what we've got. Okay, so we've got a mixer here. So this is great. So let me go ahead and tell you what is recommended in terms of sort of standard ACIP CDC recommendations. The correct answer is number two. And this is a great thing to remember about vaccines in general, that the general strategy of somebody's late for a vaccine is pick up where you left off. So now in terms of um, another issue that comes up commonly this issue that about when can you give COVID vaccine if somebody's had another recent vaccine? When can you give a vaccine if somebody recently had COVID vaccine? So let's go over this particular question. So based on current CDC guidance, what should be recommended regarding giving the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine? Let me actually, can we drop the polling question for one second? I skipped through, thank you very much. So the slide advance. Okay, so... Here's the second question, polling question, sorry. A 51-year-old man with HIV and a CD4 count of 353 received his second mRNA COVID vaccine five days ago. So now he's feeling fine. He's in clinic. He's scheduled to get a dose of the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. Okay, so he's supposed to get PPSV23. Now, the polling question here. Based on the current CDC guidance, what should be recommended regarding this PPSV23 vaccine considering he got COVID uh, second dose five days ago. Should it be A, you can give the pneumococcal vaccine at today's visit. B, you must wait at least 14 days after the COVID vaccine. Or the third choice, you must wait at least six weeks after the COVID vaccine. Okay, let's see what we've got with this one. Okay, so most people took the choice 
that was recommended up until about a week ago. So this is new information, hopefully to, to, to emphasize to everybody who's at the conference today. This is a recommendation that came out on May 14th from the CDC. So the new recommendation is COVID-19 vaccines and other vaccines may now be administered without regard to timing. So this includes simultaneous administration of the COVID-19 vaccine with other vaccines on the same day, as well as co-administration within 14 days. So the patient that I presented, it would be fine to be able to give the pneumococcal vaccine at this time. There's the link for these recommendations. Again, they just came out on May 14th, and I think this is a practice changer for a lot of people. So the one thing, though, is this is a may do this. The question is, what factors should you consider as a clinician regarding whether or not you actually co-administer these vaccines? So the first thing is, is the person behind or at risk of becoming behind on the recommended vaccine? Does that really matter with the disease that they're they're trying to prevent? What's the risk that this person has of this vaccine preventable disease? And then secondly, what's the reactogenicity profile of both of these vaccines? And, and would this really create problems giving the vaccines together? So new recommendation, hopefully everybody can take a look at that CDC recommendation, um, and this is important for clinical practice. Now let me shift gears to pneumococcal vaccines. Conceptually for pneumococcal vaccines, important to understand that the polysaccharide vaccine and the conjugate vaccine are two different types of vaccine. This is a schematic showing you how the polysaccharide vaccine works. This is a piece of the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, and these can be dialed in for multiple different serotypes. Very straightforward vaccine. Getting a piece of the polysaccharide, what it really does is it gives you predominantly a B cell or humoral immune response generating antibodies uh, in response to these uh, polysaccharide capsule antigens. Now, the conjugate vaccine is, is different. Again, you're taking a piece of the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, but you're conjugating or joining it with a protein or an, that, that basically generates a very good immune response. And sort of visually looking at this, the conjugate vaccine gives you a broader immune response. So over to the left here, similar to the polysaccharide, you get a very nice B cell response with eventually antibody production, but you also get by antigen presenting cells, a much more activated T cell response. So there's a coordinated, broader, and more longer lasting immune response. So again, the conjugate vaccine is different than the polysaccharide vaccine from an immunological standpoint. Now, what about the timing of giving these vaccines? So a 25 year old man's newly diagnosed with HIV, an initial lab show a CD4 count of 86. Viral load is 68,540. He starts on dolutegravir, TAF, FTC, comes back three weeks later. Okay, so what do we want to do regarding the timing of the pneumococcal vaccine? This is a polling question. So what would you recommend regarding giving the first dose of the pneumococcal vaccine series? He's never received pneumococcal vaccine before. So do we want to give conjugate vaccine now, PCV13? That's Prevnar, Prevnar13. Do we give the polysaccharide 23 vaccine? That's Pneumovax. Or do we want to defer and give the conjugate vaccine when the CD4 counts at least 100 or defer the, the, the conjugate vaccine until the CD4 counts at least 200. What do we like here? Okay, let's see what we got. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, about 50% of people chose the correct answer based on the OI guidelines, which is to go ahead and give the uh, conjugate vaccine now without delay. And I'll go over the rationale for that um, and let me begin by just saying that the first dose of the vaccine that you want to give is the conjugate vaccine. This should be done regardless of CD4 count. Some people may do this sort of similar to the way that this patient was handled, where they, they got started on antiretrovirals three or four weeks later, then got their first dose. I think that's fine, but there's no reason to delay till the CD4 count because goes over 100 or 200. Now, the First dose of the polysaccharide vaccine is typically given about eight weeks, at least eight weeks, I should say, after the conjugate um, and, and close to that time, ideally. But the polysaccharide vaccine should be given with consideration to the CD4 count. So let's look at that. If the CD4 counts above 200, no reason to delay. Just go ahead. You can wait at least eight weeks and then give the polysaccharide vaccine. However, if the CD4 counts are less than 200, there's a slight preference in the guidelines to wait till they get at least above 200, 
you alternatively can just go ahead and give it at the eight weeks, especially if there's logistical issues. But note, there is a slight B3 over C3 preference for deferring the, if the CD4 count is less than 200. Now, eventually, if a person is less than 60 years old, you're going to be giving them one conjugate dose and eventually three doses of the polysaccharide. And I think as clinicians are very familiar with this schedule, after this initial eight-week dose, you want to wait at least five years, and then you give another dose at age 65. The way I remember this is if you think about the one three here, that's exactly what you're doing in anybody under the age of 60. One dose of the conjugate, three doses total of the polysaccharide vaccine. A one three is an easy way to remember. No one should be receiving five or six doses of the polysaccharide vaccine. That, that's not, it's not a vaccine given every five years. That is not the recommendation. Okay. Now, why go ahead and give the conjugate at a CD4 count that's low? Part of this rec uh, recommendation is extrapolated from data from Africa, where they actually looked at individuals who were adults who had recently had invasive pneumococcal disease. The median CD4 count was low, 213. These were individuals that they randomized to get the older conjugate vaccine, which is called Prevnar 7. That's what was available at the time this study was done, versus placebo. Different than what we do it now, they gave two doses a month apart. So this isn't exactly what we do now, but I think there's some points we can take away from this. If you look at invasive pneumococcal disease with the strains in the vaccine uh, and also add in a 6A serotype, there was a 74% reduction in the persons in blue here who got the, got the conjugate, the Prevnar 7 versus placebo. So pretty significant effect in terms of invasive pneumococcal disease. But the other take-home point from this study uh, and this was published in the New England Journal, was this point that people with a baseline a CD4 less than 200 were 7.1 times as likely to develop invasive pneumococcal events as those with the CD4 count above 500. So I think these type of data, I think, influence to say, you know, people with a low CD4 count are really at a high risk and go ahead and jump in and give that first dose of the conjugate vaccine at that time. Okay, now shifting to hepatitis A immunization. Here's a quick, straightforward question. Should all adults with HIV who are not immune to hepatitis A receive the hepatitis A vaccine? The answer to that, based on recent recommendations, is absolutely yes. So the ACIP now recommends hepatitis A vaccine for all persons with HIV who are at least a year of age who are not immune to hepatitis A. And part of routine screening and, and initial evaluation, we screen people for uh, antibody to hepatitis A so you can determine who's immune or not. And this recommendation was formalized in 2020 in the MMWR. Second question, this is a polling question. 46-year-old man with HIV, CD4 count of 428. He completes the two-dose hepatitis A vaccine series. Now the question is, should you perform a post-vaccination hepatitis A serologic study testing? Yes or no? Okay. Straightforward question. Let's see what we've got. Okay, we've got a mix here. So the, the, the actual, the correct recommendation based on newer guidance is to do a post-vaccination testing. So let me show you what the recommendation is from ACIP and CDC on this. So this is the recommendation that came out in 2020. ACIP recommends post-vaccination serologic testing for all persons with HIV at least a month after completing the hepatitis A vaccine series. And I think part of this recommendation is based on all of the hepatitis A outbreaks that have occurred in the United States and a, a lot of issues related to people not um, having ideal responses to hepatitis A vaccine, especially uh, immune compromised individuals. So one point they make in this is that individuals with HIV can have a delayed hepatitis A response. So, you know, up to six months. So my own preference, what I do practically in the clinic is I, I don't get it one month after they complete the series. I typically do it at a three month or six month visit after that time period. I think that's a little more practical. I don't think a person needs to have a special visit just to come in and get their titer checked. I think it's reasonable to do it three to six months after they complete the series. Now let's take a look at hepatitis B immunization, which can get really complicated, but let's look at some 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 issues in terms of what's recommended for for initial and revaccination for people who don't respond. So first of all, everybody who comes into care for HIV should be screened for hepatitis B, and it's important to screen with these three parameters: serologic test, surface antigen, antibody to, to surface, and antibody to core. So surface antibody, 
core antibody and surface antigen, those three things will, will give you a clear indication of whether or not the person needs hepatitis treatment for B and or whether or not they need uh, further Im, uh, immunization because they're not immune or they need immunization. So let's look at this particular, this is not a polling question, but see what you would think about what you would do in your practice. So 31-year-old woman's newly diagnosed with HIV. She's got a, a CD4 count of 511. And her parameters at initial screening show non-immune to hepatitis B, no active hepatitis B. So she's a good candidate for hepatitis B vaccine, obviously. So the question is, what are the options to give people hepatitis B vaccine? And, and you know, we, we toss these around all the time in the clinic, but what do the guidance and guidelines say in terms of the options that are recommended? So let me run through this visually to, to try and summarize these recommendations. So recommendation one, according to the guidance, the highest recommendation is to give a standard dose with three doses. So straight up regular hepatitis B vaccine with single antigen Indurex B or Recombivax B. Standard dose, three doses. That's the highest recommendation. The next highest option two is high dose, four doses. So they don't like to sort of mix and match, you know, standard dose, four doses. It should be high dose, four doses. This is a lot of people familiar with this, this is so-called sort of dialysis dosing. This is for, for more difficult to immunize individuals. That's a B1 recommendation. Option three is to give the Hep B CPG with it, with it has a CPG adjuvant. For those of you, this is Heplosab B. Uh, that only requires two doses. We don't actually know in persons with HIV what the optimal dosing schedule is. That's a C3 recommendation, but obviously tremendous interest in the Heplosab B for, for persons with HIV. So just stacking these up in terms of what the guidance say, again, standard dose, three doses, highest priority, high dose, four doses, second highest rating, and then Heplosab B, two doses a month apart, most practical, but right now at the lowest guide. The last thing to mention that I think everybody's familiar with is that for people who also need immunization for hepatitis A, you can administer Twinrix, which is a combined hepatitis A and B vaccine. But important to note, in the guidance, there are two options, either to give the standard three-dose Twinrix or there's this four-dose series at day at, at zero, day seven, day 21 to 30, and 12 month. And, and this is often used when you're trying to accelerate and get a person immune on a, a quicker schedule. Now, what about people who don't respond to the hepatitis B vaccine? This is really, I think, the situation comes up over and over again in the clinic. 29-year-old man with HIV gets three standard doses of the hepatitis B vaccine, Indurex B. Two months after completing the vaccine series, he gets a hepatitis B surface antibody check, and it's less than 10. So it looks like he didn't respond. Now, based on the OI guidelines, what should be recommended when a person doesn't respond to a standard hepatitis B vaccine? This is a really important issue in clinical practice. So now notice in the guidance, things are flipped a little bit here. What moves up to the higher priority now is the high dose, four dose moves up above the standard dose, three doses. My own preference is, I, I just, over years and years of experience, if someone doesn't respond to the standard dose, three doses the first time around, I think it's very unlikely they're going to respond the second time around. So I would either go to the high dose, uh, four doses, or think about Heplosab B in this situation. Um, but one thing they do point out is if the CD4 count's low, you can consider for revaccination waiting until the CD4 count gets above 200. I think that's reasonable to do. Um, and then whatever choice you make at that time. Now, I think the real question all of us are thinking about is, well, what about, what's the role of the Heplosab B for these non-responders, uh, the CPG uh, adjuvant? So this is a very potent vaccine that gives stronger immune responses in the general population. Um, and what do we know about this in HIV? We don't know a lot. Uh, this study just came out a couple of weeks ago. This was a uh, looking at seroprotective responses after receiving Heplosab B. This was only 64 people in this study. Their current CD4 counts were pretty high, but their nadir was 283. And nadir is probably a really important factor with, with respect to hepatitis B vaccine responses. They got st standard dosing of hep Heplosab B, two doses a month apart, which is done for the general population who doesn't have HIV. And they looked at seroprotection responses. So interestingly, overall in the study, they had very good immune responses at 81%. 
But even among the prior vaccine non-responders, they had excellent responses above 80%. And this was a big chunk of the people who were involved in the study. So this is promising. Again, small numbers. It doesn't really answer the question how effective this is going to be, but it's promising data that I think leads us to where we are going to find the answer is a so-called beehive study. This is ongoing, and the beehive study is looking at two different groups. Groups A are individuals who are um, uh, who, who are non-responders to the vaccine, and and they're and then we're looking at also hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B responses in naive individuals. So the way that this study is being architected is that the non-responders are going to get randomized to either two doses of Heplosat B or three doses. And then they're going to compare the standard Injurex B, standard dosing, three doses. And then the naive individuals are going to be looking at a three-dose vaccine series. But, but notice that in this, that there are a number of serologic studies that are going to be done for, for immune responses throughout this time period. So we're hoping that there'll be enough data points to know whether or not after the two doses, they get a good response. So interesting. We should find out a lot of answers about Heplosat B after this. Well, let me take the last segment to focus on COVID vaccines in person with, with HIV. And I know this talk isn't supposed to be an entire COVID vaccine talk, but, but try and tell you where we're at now with COVID vaccines. So first of all, with COVID vaccine, just to remind everybody, the immune response really is all about this response to the spike protein, very importantly, especially to this one area called the receptor binding domain. The COVID vaccines that are mRNA vaccines, I think is everybody's familiar with, is basically uh, a, a phenomenal, innovative process where they take genetically engineered messenger RNA, put it inside of a lipid nanoparticle that then can enter into cells. So this is a delivery package that gets messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA in this region is coding for the spike protein or a variant of the spike protein. So once it reaches the cell, importantly, it's translated by the human ribosomes. And then there's two outcomes for the translated proteins. These SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins can either be shuttled fairly intact to the cell surface where they generate a lot of B cell activation, or they can be processed as peptides where they generate more of a T cell response. The point of this is, is this generates a very broad B cell and T cell immune response. And the other point is there is no mRNA that needs to go into the nucleus or goes into the nucleus. This is all process that occurs out in the cytoplasm with host ribosomes in the endoplasmic reticulum. So very safe vaccines. There's no viral replication in this. Now, what about what we have is everybody knows we've got, you know, the Moderna and Pfizer, both highly efficacious. Just the only point to note is I think everyone has heard that the indication for the Pfizer vaccine got lowered very recently down to 12. I think that's a, a great thing. Now, the third vaccine is the viral vet vector vaccine, which is a J&J &J vaccine called adenovirus type 26. Here, the delivery package is not simply a, a, a lipo a particle. It is the actual adenovirus that has been uh, made replication incompetent. So same idea, though, the construct of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is integrated in into the or spliced into the um, attenuated viral DNA. Um, and this is a non-replicating virus. Once it's inside of the cell, then these proteins can be made, generating um, you know similar responses. The efficacy with this obviously has not been quite as high, uh, lower than the uh, mRNA vaccines and a, a lot of other issues, again, just in terms of safety issues that I won't dive into. I think the, the interesting thing is what do we know about people with HIV? Unfortunately, we don't know a lot. If you go back and look at these studies, um, low percentage in all of these studies. And when you're really going to look at efficacy data with this low of a percentage, it is very difficult. Two articles today in the New England Journal looked at AstraZeneca and Novavax was a little bit more data. The Novavax trial that was presented in the New England Journal article today, which really involved a lot of the B1351 South African strains, did not look very good in persons with HIV. So um, again, there wasn't enough data in that power to determine efficacy in people with HIV. But for those of you that actually look at that article that just came out today, the data with people with HIV from the first glance of that did not look very encouraging. But this was with this so-called variant, the B1351. Um, now, so overall then, in terms of the vaccines that we are using, what what do we know and and, and what can we say? So there are this 
12 people that were studied and uh, published by the Hopkins group just very recently. And basically what they found is that there was good safety in individuals who got mRNA vaccines from the trials, but it did appear there was a slightly lower immune response in people with CD4 count less than 200. There are two preprint articles, one in Lancet, that looked at the Chad Ox vaccine, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, being widely used in Europe. Data from trials on this, again, look to be safe, look to see similar immune responses to persons without HIV. And then there's this preprint, again, from the Chad Ox from Africa. Again, only 52 people appeared to give similar immune responses um, and to people with and without HIV and appear to be safe. Again, the place where we have the most data so far is in that Novavax trial that was just published today in the New England Journal. That was 161 people with HIV, and even that wasn't powered enough to show efficacy, but that one Novavax trial looks a little bit disappointing uh, in terms of people with HIV. So I think I'm on time, and I will turn it back to Rafi and open it up to the question and answer. And, and, and Rafi, I did mention in and an email that if, if we have questions about the actual COVID vaccine, um, it may be a good idea to wait and put that with the panel, because I know there are a lot of people on the panel that have a tremendous amount of expert in the field of COVID uh, and COVID vaccines, and I certainly would love to have their input in that discussion. Thanks, thanks, David. That was really, really a tour de force. And, you know, thanks particularly for highlighting those recent changes in the guidelines, I think it's very easy to miss unless you're sort of admired in this, but particularly around the timing of COVID vaccine administration and other vaccines and, and the recommendation for the, the following up of a hep A serology um, after vaccination. I think it's very easy to, to have missed those recent changes. So thanks for particularly highlighting those. Um, we have a couple of, of questions of a very practical nature from, from the group. Um, we have one question that's wondering about your clinical experience with obesity in response to Hep B vaccination in particular. Would you, you know, out of the box, go with one of your, you know, more um, uh, the regimens that you would otherwise reserve for people who are non-responders or more likely to be immune compromised? Or is that not something that factors into your decision making? So I think the short answer is yes, I would. Uh, I think in general, um, given that there's only a slight difference in the recommendation with the um, high dose, four doses versus three dose, standard dose, I, I would in those individuals. Historically, there's a lot of data that shows that people with obesity have low responses to hepatitis B vaccine, especially in the non-HIV infected community. There's just a lot of data for that. So, yes, I would. Now, the interesting thing. I think is what about going straight to hepless AB in these people? There's data in the hepless AB data in people without HIV where that vaccine performed very well in people with very high BMIs. So I think that in my mind is really going to be the key question is should we be, and, and I don't know in the beehive study, I don't think they're specifically excluding or trying to recruit for high body mass index, but, but it would be really interesting when they analyze the data, if they're able to look at that. So I, I actually would go to the high dose, but I also would be, would, would not fault anyone who went straight to helpless AB and those individuals. Really interesting. And it'll be really exciting to see, you know, how they slice and dice the beehive data yeah. Yeah. when they have that for sure. Um, uh, when, you know, if you have someone who's a non-responder to your first hep B vaccination attempt and you, you know, made that decision to, Revaccinate using a second round of the same standard dose vaccine. What would be your go to if they're a non responder after that second round? Would you go to Heplislav immediately or would you go to one of the four dose regimens and sort of say it's a product, not a dosing issue? <laughs> so at, out of kind of, you know, I think thinking about the person who's just gotten through and gotten, you know, all six of these doses, I probably would go with the Heplislav B. It's just so practical. Um, and, and there are, you know, I will say that there, we are waiting for the beehive data. But when I have spoken to a lot of clinicians and spoken to different conferences where there's a lot of primary care clinicians, a lot of them say they are already doing this and their experience has been very good. So that is anecdotal data that, that, but it is, it appears to be, I think, a very good option. And there's at least some of this preliminary data that I showed. 
And then I think the fact that the Beehive study is going to give us the final answer. So my answer is yes. Now, I would say in my practice, I'm not going to that as the first choice in a non-responder. So in a non-responder, in my practice, what I'm doing is going to high dose, four doses. Then if they don't respond to that, then I am going to the helpless FB. So I don't, I don't want to be like overly enthusiastic. In initial immunizations in my practice right now, I'm not using helpless FB straight up. We're, you know, typically still using the indirect via Recombivax right up front. And, and is that because you're just, the data isn't robust enough to make that practice change or are there cost issues or what's your, what, what's driving that algorithm for your practice? Yeah, good question. So I think it's both. I think it's both of those. There's a cost issue. Um, I will say though, I'm, I'm really driven by the difference between theoretical and practical. And, you know, it's, it's like all the issues you get into with prep as well, too. If you, if you can give somebody two doses of a vaccine a month apart and the ability to, you know, check that off and get a person immunized, it is just so much easier than the, the other vaccine schedule. So I, I'm very enthusiastic about us. Uh, if the Heplosab B study ends up being you need a three dose series, then my enthusiasm for it's going to go way down because the, the big part for me and the cost is going to go up too if you need three doses. So I think if you factor everything in with all the people that we need to double dose, four doses, revaccinate, I'm not sure that we're actually saving a lot of money in the long run if we turn out that Heplosab B is shown to be safe and effective in people with HIV. Super helpful. Thank you. Um, we have a, we have a question. We didn't really get into a lot of discussion around influenza vaccination, but we have a question about, you know, in, in people who are living with HIV, do you have an age or CD4 threshold that you consider using the high dose quadrivalent flu vaccine, um, versus the standard dosing? So I love that question. The answer is no, because honestly, in our clinic, we have the one vaccine that everybody gets and we, we typically have it. It's so protocol oriented that people are typically getting these um, e- administered outside of clinic visits and in clinic visits. And so I have not done that. There is a rationale, I think, for people over 65 um, to be able to do that. The, the one point I do want to make about flu shots, and this is really more relevant for children, is that the live attenuated nasal influenza vaccine should not be given to people with HIV. That is on the list regardless of CD4 count, that it's not recommended. So practically, I think for me, the biggest problem for influenza vaccine has been getting people to be willing to get it. I- I'm shocked that, you know, people line up, they'll get their pneumovax, they'll get their meningococcal vaccine, and then I bring up flu shot. I don't want a flu shot. So I, I don't know, if, Rafe, have you seen that too, that there's something about the flu shot that, that people really don't want to get? So honestly, for me, the bigger factor is getting them a shot, and, and I think that's the highest priority. Yeah, no, David, I, I completely agree with you. And we, we hear all the time, I don't want to get the flu shot. I got it. And then I got the flu. Yeah. And, you know, trying to disambiguate and unpack that statement, yep. you know, um, it ends up being, you know, sort of often a non-productive one, but we want to, we try and have and just encourage people. Yeah. It's and it's hard. such an involved conversation because like, <laughs> well, maybe they got the flu shot, but then they got RSV or they got something else, or right. maybe they got the flu and then they would have had a worse response if they, they got some partial immunity. So uh, it, it is a tough, it's a tough issue. And, and I, you know, I try and respect people and, and, and go for the highest priority and, and try and get whatever vaccines we can get in. Yeah, thank you. It is, it is a very complicated conversation. And, you know, I think people have preconceived notions that are difficult to disembowel them of. Um, and we saw that with COVID also. Um, yeah. I, you know, we have a bunch of questions about COVID vaccines that I'm going to try and leave for the panel discussion a little Perfect. bit later. Well, someone is wondering if you have any insight into what drove the change in recommendation um, about the fact that it's okay to give COVID vaccination contemporaneously with other vaccines, or is it just increasing experience that gives us that comfortability regarding side effect and adverse event profiles? So I think it is more just experience, but I will promise that between now and the time of our panel, I will see if I can dig a little deeper into that and see if I can find out something. Again, this fact, this recommendation was just posted, so I'll see if I can find out a little bit of information about the rationale for it. Yeah, thank you so much. We have a couple of questions about hep B treatment and also about COVID in transplant patients that I think maybe it'd be, if it's okay with you, we'll we'll save for the panel and we can all talk about it at that point because it's it's time for us 
to go on break. Um, so with that, I'm going to say thank you, David, so much for that really wonderful presentation, the great questions, the new information and the discussion. And thanks to our, our audience for the great participation. Hopefully this has been helpful and enjoyable to you. We're going to take a break um, uh, until 10.55 a.m. Pacific time. So um, the next 20, 30, 30, 30, 30 minutes, sorry. Um, and we will come back then uh, with some additional exciting topics. Thanks, everyone, and we'll talk soon.